We are live. Gather around, everybody. We are about to discuss the 10 principles of RMR eating. This is a very important workshop, especially if you are new to the Facebook group or you're playing with the idea of banting. Oh, but I've heard bad things about banting. I've seen people lose weight, but it's not healthy. There was the lawsuit. Who won the lawsuit? So if you have any questions about banting, this is the best best live broadcast to watch so if you're watching please just like the comment or i mean like the post and let us know that you're here say hello Jono. i'm watching this even if you're watching the recording later it's still nice to see that people watched it and we're going to get started in a couple minutes so what i'd like you to do if you're the first one to tune in is to just share the post quickly just share it say hey we're going to watch Jono, and we'll get started in a few seconds i'll put my little banner on here quickly we're going to discuss the 10 principles principles of RMR eating. Hey, this is vital. All righty. So tag a friend. If you have a friend who's like a skeptic, oh, you're going to die if you banned. Don't trust Jono. This is going to be a very important, very, very important webinar. I'm going to bust some myths. I'm going to tell you how you can lose weight super quickly doing banting. We're going to discuss a whole lot of stuff, and you're going to love it. All righty, let's get cracking. Let's get cracking. So the 10 principles of RMR eating. Okay, it's slightly bigger than that. But before I get cracking, I just want to give you a tiny bit of background. I'll go through it super quickly. So the reason I run this company is not because I'm the chef. Okay, I am the chef, and that's how I started writing this book. But my interest is actually in transformation. So I started off as this trash guy in high school. I used to smoke weed. I used to drink. Even on school nights, I was like a total rubbish. And my friends at high school gave me the nickname Trash because I was like super trashy. Then throughout my 20s, I became an athlete. I ended up breaking a world record swimming from Mozambique to Madagascar. And I became a best-selling author. And I became an accomplished chef. But what I realized when people started losing weight, eating my recipes, was that I actually had a huge interest in transformation because I had transformed my own life. And if I had taken myself from being in a dark place, you, you know, with destructive behavior, I could actually help people eat my recipes more often or be more disciplined with eating the food that I was promoting. And so in 2015, we shifted from being focused on just getting people to eat the right thing to actually developing certain frameworks that would help people continue to eat that way because we saw the results were so good. So my interest is definitely in food, but my, my passion is in transformation. And before I wrote Real Meal Revolution, I had this girlfriend called Kate, and we started dating in 2008. And Kate had been yo-yo dieting for most of her adult life. And we actually broke up for two years. And, and then I saw her again in 2012, and she had lost a ton of weight. But she was also really happy. She'd been taking care of herself. And, and we got back together. And then we got married, and we had two kids, and she put on a whole bunch of weight again. But what I didn't tell you is that when she lost weight in 2012, she had lost it because she was following the Noakes diet. And I was looking for a way to get into high-performance cooking. So I saw the Noakes diet. Like girlfriend, love of my life, losing weight. And I decided, okay, I'm going to approach Tim Noakes and I'm going to ask him to write a book with me. And that's what happened with Real Meal Revolution. But over time, I noticed that Kate really battled to actually stick to it. So it became much more than just knowing what the right foods were. And, you know, the picture was a lot bigger than that. Anyway, through a lot of the programs at Real Meal Revolution, Kate's actually managed to transform and she sustained weight loss for about two years now. Um, and so this is a photograph taken last year. She's actually lost more weight since then. Um, and she's done some Real Meal programs. She's lost 25 kilos and she's loving life. I also managed to lose quite a lot of weight. So this is a photograph taken in 2012, 13. And that was me at 100 kilos. And this is me last year sometime at 81 kilos. So I put on like a couple of kilos since then, but only one or two. Anyway, so I know how to lose weight on my own as well. So when the book came out, it exploded. The real food lists went crazy. There were banting lists all over the place. WhatsApp, I mean, Facebook groups, product ranges. And there was a whole lot of stuff that we weren't involved in. But the word banting was 
was used synonymously with with any low carb diet that anyone was trying to punt in South Africa. And that was really cool. And no one can own the word banting, which is a benefit, actually, because it means it would spread faster. But the other the downside is that it can't be controlled. So I'm very comfortable with everyone having their own take. I think that everyone's entitled to their own take on a on an eating framework. But this is what our framework looks like. We These are what our lists look like. And our goal is to reach 100 million people in the next three or four years. So we want to reach 100 million people with these lists by the 28th of February, 2025. And that is our big, hairy, audacious goal. And one of the things we do when we have clients join Real Meal Revolution is teach them how to set big, hairy, audacious goals. So what we've realized over time, originally we just thought that banting was good for high performance, but it's actually, it's not it's not like the best diet for high performance. It's actually really good at reversing chronic disease, at helping people reverse a lot of sort of discomfort, to lose weight really fast. But what we realized over time was that we had a whole lot of customers coming to us with the same conditions. And so I want you to have a look at these lists And just pick out, like, maybe there are three or four that really stand out for you that you really connect with. Because these are the conditions that we deal with at Real Meal Revolution on a daily basis. We we deal with a whole lot of stuff on the emotional side. There's a whole lot of stuff on the physical appearance side. We all battle with body dysmorphia. And then there's a whole lot of stuff that we deal with that we teach that reverses medical conditions. So we do not offer medical advice, but... We it just so happens we offer like cooking and meal planning advice, and that just coincidentally reverses all of these things like type 2 diabetes. And I'll show you a couple studies soon. So while you're going through this talk with me and and just hearing what I have to say, just imagine what it would be like for you if you took those conditions that you saw that you connected with in the previous slide. Think about what life would be like if those were not a problem anymore. If you're type 2 diabetic, imagine you no longer had to take medication. If you have the muffin top, imagine what it would feel like if you just pull up a pair of jeans and pull them shut and, and wear a tight T-shirt over that. Imagine what that would feel like. Or if your migraines went away or if you didn't have to take high blood pressure meds anymore. Imagine what that would be like. And then imagine what you would actually do with your time, how you would spend your time differently to the way you spend your time now. Who would you spend that time with and where would you do it? Where would you go that's different? Where would you go that you're not going right now? And then how would you have fun? So you think about now, you're having fun, but every time you have lots of fun, you actually maybe feel a bit like bad the next day, like you don't feel healthy, you know, it's put you back. So how would it feel if you have fun in a healthy way that actually makes you feel good about yourself? So imagine that life. Because that's really what our, what Real Meal Revolution is about. You know, losing weight's one thing, but just like money, money just buys you choices. And it's what choices you make when you have that money that really make your life rich and fulfilling. And it's the same with being thin. A lot of us are desperate to be thin, but we've never thought about why or what, what we get out of that. And so what you get out of being thin or lean or light or whatever you want to, however, which way you want to look at it is actually a richer and fuller experience of all the other things in life. So we're going to cover keto versus banting. I'm just going to clear up a little bit of uh, confusion there. We're going to look at the best band for your buck. So how can you band to guarantee you are going to be maxing out on weight, but also maxing out on pleasure in life? How, like, what are the biggest mistakes in banting or the biggest banting? And then I'm going to tell you about a special deal that's running at Real Meal Revolution. So if you want to stay to the end, I've got a great deal for you that I highly recommend you stay and listen to because it's going to, it's actually going to expire very soon. It's the kind of deal that you want and it's getting fantastic results. Okay, so let's go into keto versus banting. And this is a slide, this is a, a screenshot of a tweet from Claire Yilson Stratum. Now, Claire is, for those of you who don't know, she is the, the dietitian. She was head of Association Dietetics South Africa. And she was the one who took Tim Noakes to, to the HPCSA to be uh, crucified, I would say. But anyway, so about banting on Twitter, and I can't see the question here, but what what she answered was, yes, lower carbs, but still carbs with enough fiber, good quality fats, not too much animal protein, certainly not banting though. 
hashtag banting is not LCHF. And so anyway, whoever was reading this, Nick Lowe tweeted this to Tim Noakes. And I want to read to you what Tim Noakes tweeted back. Historical note, on the night that John O'Prout would submitted Real Meal Revolution to the publishers, he changed one word in the text, LCHF, into banting. It was a masterstroke that introduced um, South Africans uh, and the world to banting. He thought um, as that LCHF and banting are... So here's the thing. That's a true story. The night before we sent Real Meal Revolution to print, um, I was chatting to our editor, Tudor, and to me, he's like, John, LCHF, it just sounds a bit like a chemical. It's not that cool. Is there a better word we can use? And I said, yeah, um, let's use banting because Noakes had told the story about William Banting um, in the book. And he said, oh, that's awesome. So he went through the whole book and he took out all the references to LCHF and replaced them with Banting. So unfortunately, uh, Banting is 100% LCHF and LCHF is 100% Banting because Real Meal Revolution was an LCHF cookbook. Okay, so now you probably think like, what? I'm so confused now. So let me explain how it works. You get low-carb diets. Now, by dietetics standards, it, a low-carb diet is anything under 200 grams of carbohydrate, I think. But uh, typically, it's it's 40 grams, 40% 40 of the calories come from carbohydrates. That's a low-carbohydrate diet by the dietitian standards. When you get a when you get the low-carb folk, so people who call themselves low-carbers or whatever, or the people who you know use low-carb to reverse diabetes or whatever, they are talking about a different or a more intense version of low-carb, which is usually under 100 grams of carbs per um, uh, 100%, I mean, under 100 grams of carbs a day, um, or closer to like 15 or 10% coming from carbs per day. And then you get down to 50 and 25, and that's when you're going into ketosis or ketogenic levels. So... What's really important is that low carbers in like the low carb sort of cult like us, they also are against gluten and seed oils. There are dietitians who so-called low carb diets where they still include a bit of gluten, like some sourdough, um, you know, and canola oil, etc. But typically like the low carb stalwarts like Steve Finney and Eric Westman, Tim Noakes, um, even myself, we, we don't believe in gluten and we don't believe in seed oil. That, that's like what separates us. Then underneath that umbrella, or in the umbrella still, you get LCHF, keto, and banting. Now, there was a slide I wanted to show you, but it's boring, of Google Trends. And basically, LCHF, or low-carb, high-fat, is the original term. And that came out in about 2000. Uh, in fact, uh, that's the, another word that Acton, Atkins used to use to refer to to low carb. And then uh, Banting came out in 2013. And then if you watch Google Trends, in about 2015 or 16, the word keto shows up, just spikes on Google Trends, and it's and it's massive. But basically, if you go look at what people on the are doing, which is predominantly in America, um, they're all doing the same thing that people on low carb are doing. They're using a, a few artificial sweeteners. They're avoiding grains. They're avoiding carbohydrates. And most of them are staying between 25 and 50 grams of total carbs per day, which is very similar to banting, if not exactly the same. So all banting recipes are keto, and all keto recipes are banting. Banting and keto both are low carb diets and can both be referred to as LCHF. If you are very strict when you are banting or keto or LCHF, you can go into ketosis, maybe. But you can be eating keto and you can be eating LCHF and banting and not be in ketosis. Okay, that's the thing. So, so when someone says, oh, is this keto? What they're saying is, is it low in carbohydrates? But someone who's following a keto diet, some keto meals, doesn't necessarily have to have the intention of going into ketosis. And the same applies for all the others. Okay, so I hope I clarified that. They're interchangeable. They're the same thing. And uh, I think the only thing I kind of disagree with is the fat thing where we say high fat, because a lot of people call it a high diet. And I'll get into that in more detail just now. So we've done keto versus banting, and now we're going to look at the best bant for your buck. So this is actually the thing you want to pay attention to. This is going to teach you how to lose weight really fast and have lots of fun while you're on the banting diet. This is it. 
So pay attention. Okay. So the 10 principles of RMR banting or of RMR eating are on this page. And this page is super simple. So the green list means go, the orange list means slow, and no is what happens on the red list. So I want you to ignore the key for now because that's like getting into biohacker territory. And let's just look at, at, at the first step. So the number one element of RMR eating is that it's low carb. So on the green list, we've got low carb ingredients. The orange list, we've got medium carb ingredients. And the red list, we have high carb ingredients. So that is one principle, no carbs or no, no high carb ingredients, slow on medium carb ingredients and go for it on low carb ingredients. Okay, so don't let anybody tell you that banting is a no carb diet. That's trash, that's trash speak. We are offended by that, okay. Then sugar, so we want no sugar. Okay, remember that banting like reverse Tim Noakes' diabetes. That was the point. Well, actually, let's just straighten that out. He only tested for diabetes after he had started banting and he had diabetes. So a lot of people think that he gave himself diabetes from banting. But we all know that, bant that diabetes is a lifestyle condition that takes years and years and years to get to. He is now off all the medication that manages his diabetes. And, uh, and so he reverses diabetes eventually using banting. Okay, many other people have done it much faster than he did. Okay, so no gluten, no seed oils, and no sneaky sneaky. So that's one, two, three, four, five principles right there. Now, the fifth principle, sneaky sneaky, is quite confusing for many people. But what this principle is, is for you to be aware, to be informed, and to be empowered. And that means picking up food products and looking at the label. My favorite example of this is the protein bar. Whenever we're on a health plug, we stop eating bar ones and Snickers, and then we eat the protein bar. So we buy the USN protein bar, build muscle mass, burn fat, the energy bar, which is proudly South African, all these different things. And what they say on the front of the bar, 21 grams of protein, and you're like, yes, I'm going to get protein. And especially dudes, they're like, oh, my muscle is going to get birth for you. And then what happens is they don't read the back of the label. And if you read the back of the label, it says 21 grams of protein, 40 grams of carbohydrate, of which 39 grams is sugar. So well done. What you actually bought was 39 grams of sugar. And if it said that on the front of the bar, 39 grams of sugar, there's no ways you would buy it. And so sneaky sneaky is, an, uh, is another umbrella term for like bad marketing or good marketing of bad food. And so there isn't one product that fits into this, but in general, we want you to be alert and watch out for all products um, and all of their marketing messages. The best packaging or the best advertised food is food that cannot be advertised because like you're going to buy an onion or a pepper or spinach and you're going to buy it super fresh. The chances are it's not packaged. Okay, so those are like the five no's. No high carbs, no sugar, no gluten, no seed oils, no sneaky sneaky. And then we get into like what we do want you to do. So the first thing is, and this, and, and please take this within budget and accessibility and all of those other things that matter, because we have been criticized in the past for being elitist. I, I don't think that healthy food is expensive. I think really unhealthy food is too cheap. And so it's changed our perception a lot. But we want you to eat that is real and whole, as real and as whole as possible. Okay, that's the most important principle. Just eat real food. Even if you don't cut out carbohydrates and you eat food, only food that is real, you will be healthier. And that's not a controversial statement. Okay. Then we want you to mix texture, flavor, and color. Now, this is really important because what happens is, um, and this is not just dietitians, nutritionists, everyone, like even athletes, they tend to get a little like biohacker-ish, you know, where they start looking at daily allowances and they're looking at like tracking, am I getting enough this nutrient, that nutrient? And we begin to come, we begin to get a little bit obsessive. Now, what I want people to do is to just eat naturally, freely, and enjoy the food and with their health. And so the best way to make sure you're getting a large variety of nutrients and a large variety of fiber, or fiber is fiber, but a large variety of nutrients, but also a large variety of flavor and color, hang on, a large variety of nutrients is to make sure you are mixing texture, flavor, and color. Because if you're mixing texture, flavor, and color on a daily basis, you're going to be getting all the different nutrients. 
that you like. So the worst thing you could do is decide I'm going to eat steak and spinach for like five years straight and then just eat that because I'm sure you'll rock out with some kind of nutrient deficiency in one way or another. Um, and then even worse would be to eat steak and spinach and then take a whole lot of supplements to fill the gaps. Rather, eat like steak and chicken and be a vegan meal or vegetarian meal every now and then and mix up lots and lots of different vegetables to make sure that you're getting all the micronutrients, all the fiber that you can find. Okay. And then finally, be practical. Now, when the Red List came out in the first book and in the sort of following years, people became quite religious, almost like like eating a non-banting meal was immoral. I hear people say things like, I'm good at the moment or I've been really bad. Just remember, like, food can't be good or bad. It's just food. It's a thing. It's an inanimate object. And so it's either healthy or it's not healthy. And even if it's physically unhealthy, it might be healthy for you to just take a break every now and then and have something delicious. The point is that we want you to be practical. And so there are examples like dried oregano. If you are on a low-carb diet and you're trying to stay under 50 grams a day, which, by the way, is, is a good way for you to accelerate your weight loss, you're going to want to stay away from most high carb foods, but like dried oregano is 60 grams of carbs per hundred gram. Mm -hmm. But if you are only having like half a teaspoon of dried oregano in a tomato sauce that you're making with your chicken parmigiana, that's not going to break the bank because it's only like half a gram of carbohydrates in total. The same with garlic. Garlic is 30 grams of carbs per hundred grams. And if you have half a clove of garlic, you know, grated over your osobuco with some gremolata, like that's not going to break the bank either. It's not going to make you fat. So don't be too obsessive. Think about the general carb intake you are going to have for the day. Okay. So those are the 10 principles. You want to watch your carbs. Then you want to avoid sugar, gluten, seed oils, and sneaky, sneaky. And then you want to eat real food that is that is in a variety of texture, flavor, and color, um, and be practical. And that's what we preach. That is what we preach. And that's actually what banting looks like. So, so the people who say like it's all meat and there's no fiber, and no, this is from a variety of books that I've written. This is from Raising Superheroes, Real Meal Revolution, um, Low Carb Cooking, and then there are a couple from the online course in here. So this is this is what our version of, of banting. Is. And many people see it differently, and I'll explain why in a, in a few minutes. But what you can see here is there's a variety of color, texture, flavor, and these are delicious foods. You've got seafood in a in a um, in a laksa sauce. This is a vegetarian dish with um, aubergines and feta with some toasted almonds. You've got tuna pokey. You've got cottage pie, beef carpaccio. I would actually serve some side dishes with that. This is a creamy gem squash mash with like a burnt sage butter. And then we've got manche too, cooked with, I think, basil and chili and some pan roasted cherry tomatoes. This is like, this is good food. And you can eat this stuff and actually lose weight. In fact, live a really, really long and healthy life. And this is what Jane did. So Jane, who is a client of Real Meal Revolution, over the last year and a bit, she lost, she actually lost more than 45 kilos now, but she reduced her weight by 45 kilos, reduced her BMI from, I think that's beyond morbidly obese or morbidly obese to, to just on the threshold of being overweight. So she dropped three classes um, in, the, in the obesity sort of BMI scale. Four dress sizes, that's insane. And then dropped her trigs by 1%. And, and she's a sapper living in London. And you can see she's super happy. And she's transformed her relationship with food uh, following our principles. So, so now we're going to talk about maxing out on results. Now, there are lots of biological things you can do to max out on results. You can do intermittent fasting. You can be super strict calories. You can uh, throw in some high-intensity exercise. Although, you know, like when you're on where you are on the journey, but that can be quite traumatic. The main thing when it comes to habit change, to, to lasting change, so this is like when it's permanent, is, is habit building. Now, we can all lose 12 kilos in 12 weeks, you know, if we have enough weight to lose and we're strict enough. Generally, it's possible unless there's a medical condition or medication getting in the way. But what happens is we do this so fast and it's so intense that we actually end up falling off the bus. And the two things that get in the way are our ability to obtain automaticity um, and our relationship with ourselves, which I link to our identity and our beliefs. So I want to talk about automaticity first. 
So the, the best way to lose weight fast is to be super strict, super strict, and, and just like hold your breath for 12 weeks and get the best results. And the paradox there, it's not really paradox, more like the unfortunate bad news, is that the best way to get sustained results is to make smaller changes. And, and so this is, <laughs> this is what you think should happen when you set off on a goal, you think you'll start here, the goal to get to is here, and you think it's going to go up in a straight line. Um, or you think that you're going to reach your micro goal first, and then you're going to reach your, your end goal. But when you are habit building, the best way to build a habit is to start with just one small habit and build on that habit. And James Clear, this is I'm citing James Clear here, who's the author of Atomic Habits. What he talks about is actually taking one habit, um, like even if it's flossing, and only improving by 1% a day which is pretty insane. So that's like flossing one tooth and then starting off with just flossing the tooth and then putting the floss down and then coming back the next day. Because you're conditioning yourself to be in the habit of flossing more than you are actually getting the flossing done. And he says, even if you're sick, you know, go to the gym, swipe your card, get dressed, go and like pick up a weight off the, off the gym counter and then like go back to your you know, to the change room, have a sauna and go home. Although, you, should, you know, these days you can't go anywhere if you're sick. But, but that's, that's the, the thing because what it does is it programs your mind to be in a habit. So start really small. And then what happens is you actually, because you're building habits so slowly, you really get disappointed because you don't get the results. But if you're only improving by 1% a day, what's happening is you're actually building a really, really solid foundation. And that's the problem with most of us when we try things. We don't have a solid foundation. And because it's such a small step, it's not a massive spear in the side of your day. And so over time, what happens is you've started just flossing one tooth. In a couple of days, you start flossing two. In a couple of days, you start flossing three. And eventually, you're in the habit of picking up the floss and putting it in your mouth. And it becomes quite effortless to, to keep flossing. Where the other route would be to floss one all 24 teeth on top and bottom rows like in one day and if you haven't flossed in a while it's sore and you kind of left for three or four days feeling a bit sore before you even want to try again and so the beauty of that is if you're building these habits on a foundation eventually you reach critical mass the same way it happens with compound interest where you reach a point where you start getting results but then the results never revert. So you never put the weight back on again because you've finally reached the point where you're getting results, but all of those habits are on a strong foundation. And so they last. And that's how you create lasting change. I can share an anecdote here with my wife, Kate. I saw a nutrigenomicist who said that she had um, a dairy intolerance and that was causing migraines, that she was off gluten. And she, she went cold turkey with like banting many, many times, banting do can the works in the time between losing that first 20 kilos in 2013 and then 2019 where she stopped getting proper results. And what happened was eventually she just realized, okay, medical diagnosis is I have this intolerance. And so all she did was cut gluten and dairy, which is quite a big, it's quite a big one, but she cut it and she was motivated because of, of her health. But she did that for a year and a half before cutting out carbohydrates. Naturally, from cutting out dairy and gluten, she actually lost about, I think, eight or nine kilos, but not restricting calories and not restricting carbs. And then she decided to start cutting out carbs and her results improved. But the thing is now she's on 25 kilos and those habits are rock solid because she's been building them for two and a half years. Okay. And this is what you want. If the habit is built in, you reach a state called automaticity. And automaticity is when something is automatic. So you do lots and lots and lots of repetitions, and eventually it just becomes second nature. And so, for, for example, at the moment you might say, oh, no, healthy eating is automatic for me. And I'd say, cool, well, what about, you know, if, how, how would you compare that to brushing my teeth? Oh, no, I'm healthy and I brush my teeth exactly the same. And I say, okay, cool. Well, if someone died in your, who was close to you, I know this sounds quite dramatic, but this is the real test. If, if, if something tragic happened, you lost your job, you lost someone that you love, would you still wake up in the morning and brush your teeth? Yes. Okay. That's a habit. That is, that is something that is automatic. Would you still eat everything, um, stay super healthy, keep exercising? And if the answer is yes, then you have obtained automaticity with your habits. If the answer is no, 
then there's still work to do unless it's not that important to you like that that's the other thing like if it doesn't need to be and you're comfortable just like you know yo-yoing through different stressful periods and some people are like i definitely eat more when i'm super stressed and i eat less when things are going well luckily things go well more than um i'm stressed uh but but that depends on on what level you're looking for but pure automaticity means that you can sustain any injury be it physical or mental and continue and then the final piece on on identity is this so this is from the same book it's atomic habits change case true behavior change is identity change when your behavior and your identity are fully aligned you are no longer pursuing change you're simply acting like the type of person you already believe yourself to be so right now you might see yourself as the jolly champagne loving foodie and you think oh the jolly champagne loving foodie needs to go on a diet and needs to do some exercise whereas if you believe yourself to be thin you wouldn't be acting in conflict with who you believe you are. So in other words, it wouldn't be like, oh, I've got to go exercise. Oh, I've got to eat the spinach. It would be like, ooh, I'm just being who I am, and this is what I do. And that's what identity change looks like. So that's how to max out on results. It's the opposite of what most people think. Most people think I was going to tell you like the secret muti to crush 30 kilograms in 12 weeks. That's how to get the best results is go slow. Okay, and now we're going to talk about the failures of banting. I'm just having a sip here. Okay, this is big. So let me tell you why I've written this piece. I, I'm going to dive in front of a car if I hear one more person say, I had to stop banting because of all that fat. Um, if there, and there are a couple others, but like, it just has such a bad rep and we need to set the record straight. So if I say something that really gets you warm, warm and fuzzy or excites you, please share this post because everyone needs to know this. Okay. So the first thing loss in general, and, 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 and this is something that irritates me about life is that when someone says, Oh, I need to lose weight. The first thing they say is, oh, I need to go and exercise. And my initial response is like, you do not need to exercise. You don't need to exercise to lose weight. And the thing is, when you are like one of Real Meals clients, who, like anyone who's got like 10 to 120 kilos to lose, but like the more, the more the merrier for us. If you are like 50 or 80 kilos overweight, the last thing on earth you want to do is exercise. Even if you're 20 kilos overweight, God, exercising if you're 20 kilos overweight is like a pain in the ass and it's a pain in the knees. It's a pain. And so you don't need to do it. Don't do that to yourself. Don't exercise unless you want to. And this is the thing. So this is a study that was done in Canada, in rural Canada. It was supervised by a whole lot of people we really love, including Jay Wartman and, um, and Tim Noakes. And what they did was they ran a, um, a, they gave all these people the keto diet or banting diets, low carb diet, whatever. And then they put them in little groups and then the doctors checked in on them. Okay. And it ran for three months. It was a 12 week trial. Okay. But the, so the trial really, in, and they do keto like real meal does keto to assist in control, in appetite control. Participants were instructed not to undertake moderate or vigorous physical activity until they had reached their weight loss goal. So what this is saying is you do not need to exercise to reach your goal. In fact, Please don't exercise until you reach your goal because exercise is going to make you hungry. And if you're hungry, you're going to eat more. So the old advice was eat less, exercise more. Now, if you're told to exercise more, it's going to want to make you eat more. So they're basically saying do these two things that are going to make you really not want to do these two things. So that's, so that's that myth bust. Like, please don't exercise unless you really, really want to. Usually if you get thin, you start wanting to exercise, but it's not the other way around. Okay, then... You have to eat all that fat. Please, 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 please don't eat all the fat. So this is a picture that I found on a website. Luckily, um, this isn't one of our clients, but I remember there was a Facebook group called Banting Seven Day Meal Plans, and uh, I was chatting to Rita years ago, and she said that um, one of her clients, one of the people in, in their group, ate a whole block of butter. And she said, I'm trying so hard to lose weight. And I just keep eating more fat and I can't lose it. And I lost, I've eaten a block of butter every day now and I'm still not losing any weight. And so we suspect where it came from was where people, all of a sudden it was like you need to eat fat to lose weight because banting is this high fat diet. And so what we suspect is it was interpreted like a painkiller. Like if you have a beast of a headache, you got to take 
three panados. Whereas if it's a mild headache, just take one. Well, if you've got a ton of weight to lose, you need to eat like a block of butter. But if you only lose, you have a tablespoon. I, I don't know. But please, that, that is totally wrong. But the other thing is that my recipes, okay, were very fatty. Now, this is totally my fault. I didn't really understand how the mechanisms worked. I hadn't read much of the science and I hadn't even been to many of Tim Noakes's talks. And what I was told was you can cook with butter and cream now. Butter and cream are no longer, you know, out of bounds. So you tell a 28 year old chef with a fine dining background that he's allowed to cook with butter and cream and you get not butter chicken and courgette and garlic gratin with food food substances swimming in butter and cream. And that's just what happened. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. I put across the wrong message. And uh, that's definitely not what it's about. Okay. This will explain it slightly better. So Steve Finney is the greatest, or at least the most prolific, some argue the greatest low-carb scientist in the world. So he worked with Dr. Atkins, and he he has done more. He's been researching keto and low-carb for 35 years. In fact, he's just raised hundred over two hundred million dollars um, with a huge entrepreneur called Sami Inkinen and another guy, Jeff Bolek, in California, and they are the world's first diabetes multi-stack startup. In other words, they do support medical advice, um, remote medical advice through an app that manages your keto journey. It's a super high tech and it's for, for diabetes reversal. And they have a clinical trial that's live on their site that you can go and check out. Anyway, this is what he says. When you go on a weight loss ketogenic diet, you can eat less on your plate because you're burning the fat that comes from your inside. It comes from your love handles and your hips and so on. When you're burning your own body fat, it looks like a high protein diet, but the scales go down because the body's burning its own fat stores. Boom. Okay. What he is saying is that even though we say it's a ratio of 70% of your calories coming from fat and 20% or, or 60, 60 fat, 60 to 70 fat, 20 to 30% uh, protein and 10, 15 grams of carbs. What he's saying is that the ratio that you actually ingest looks different because part of that 60 to 70% of the fat that you are being fueled on is actually coming from your insides. And that makes sense if you think about it. If, you are, if you've stored a lot of fat, your body is, it has stored for a reason. It's reserves for the famine. You know, your body is trying to protect you from famine all the time. And if you get a whole lot of dietary fat and your body's going to burn that first because your body, the last thing on earth your body wants to do is tap into reserves. So if you are trying to wait on a keto diet and you are eating extra fat because, because butter chicken or whatever, you're doing it wrong and it's not going to help you lose weight. So some people in the beginning, they, they eat quite a lot of fat and they still manage to lose, but eventually that party ends and, and you plateau and you have to reduce the fat. So please trust me. You don't want to be pouring lots of extra fat on your food. I think the moral of the story is just don't be afraid of fat. Like butter is not going to kill you, but don't like swim in pools of butter. That's not the right way to do it. Um, what I have read before is that once you get to about 17 or 18% body fat, then, then you are ready to start adding in extra fat, uh, but that's up to you. Okay. Then the other myth I've heard is, oh, that fat will give me a heart attack. Now, this is an excerpt from a, a science, a, what, from a diet, a note, basically, that the American Heart Association put out. And it says, um, previously, the dietary guidelines for Americans, sorry, this is the dietary guidelines for Americans, they recommended that intake be limited to no more than 300 milligrams per day. The 2015 DGAAC will not bring forward this recommendation because available evidence shows no appreciable consumption of dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol consistent with the conclusions of blah, blah, blah. Cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern for overconsumption. In other words, dietary cholesterol doesn't equal blood cholesterol. Now, there are other studies that Noak speaks about where he says, you know, even blood cholesterol is not necessarily associated with the high risk of death, and it's more closely related to the particle size, and the, it's actually not just whether it's LDL or HDL, but whether it's the small, dense LDL, and if you're in an imbalance of that, then you're at risk or whatever. But what this is saying is that eating butter and high cholesterol foods does not necessarily impact your blood cholesterol. 
Now, I read the rest of this report, and it was almost like this note in, but then left the rest of the report the same. So the rest of the report still says avoid saturated fat, avoid this, avoid that, avoid cholesterol, but there was this note in there. So kind of, they kind of were like, okay, well, me, mm, okay, so cholesterol not so bad, but we're just going to like drop this in there and let people figure it out for themselves. Um, okay. It's good for weight loss, but it's unhealthy. It's extreme. Okay, now I have heard this. This is the same study I cited earlier, and um, I don't expect you to read that. I've, t- I've taken out the important bits and made them in big writing for you. And the first thing is that the weight loss was real. So in these three months, people lost 12 to 8, 12.8 kilograms on average. The average reduction in BMI was 4.7, which is massive. That's like a, almost a whole class of obesity. Then the people with elevated abdominal circumference, which is like once you reach a certain threshold, you are elevated. 24% of them who were diagnosed with elevated blood, uh, elevated abdominal circumference reduced that to below the threshold. Then 38% of the people who were diagnosed with metabolic syndrome after the study, three months, they no longer, they were like not undiagnosed, but un, I think it's like de-diagnosed. I'm the chef, just remember that, okay? Uh, but 38% of them, so that's quite a big whack. But the PHQ-9 score fascinates me. So this is a, is a survey for depression, and, um, and basically it's a scale from 1 to 27. And if you are under 10, it means you are mildly depressed. If you're under 5, you're fine. But if you're over 10, it means you're moderately depressed and you can be medicated, okay? So that's why they said the, the PHQ-9 score under 10. So 15.8% of the people who were above 10 after this trial became under 10 in other words they increased or in their depression or in, yeah i mean not improve the depression but yeah you know what i mean so improve the symptoms of depression <laughs> what that means is that whatever happened on this trial made people less unhappy i don't believe that it was banting i know many people will be like oh you know it's keto it helps i think it's more closely related to people taking care of themselves which increases your self-worth and also people being in community so people helping each other towards a common goal like that really makes people happy makes them connected but i thought it was really interesting taking care of yourself in a group makes you happier Less depressed. Okay, blood pressure reduced from 136 over 85 to 122 over 77. Spectacular results. HDL came down from 1.34. I mean, HDL went up, which should. LDL came down, which it should. Triggs came down, which it should. And the HbA1c concentration came down a lot. So it came down from an average of 7.47 to 6.95. So that's from diabetic range to almost pre-diabetic. And some people did reverse their diabetes. Others didn't. But that's still phenomenal results. Okay, so anyone who says banting is good for weight loss, but it's not healthy, these are the metrics that an insurer is going to look at. And an insurer is going to use all of these scores to decide on how risky it is to insure you. And I can guarantee you, if you have the scores on the left over here, insurer is going to charge you a ton. If you have the scores on the right, your insurer is going to dig your vibe and maybe not the HbA1c1, but insurer is going to be pretty happy with you. So it is most definitely healthy to do whatever the people in this trial did, which was banting in a, in a group environment. Too much meat, not enough fiber. So you've seen this before, but I'm just going to say it again. There's totally enough vegetables. It's not all meat. You can stay low carb and still eat a ton of vegetables and have them all be really delicious. And Margie did it too. So Margie said this is a totally holistic approach. I can decide how much and when to eat or not eat, unlike needing to have X meals a day. So Margaret that follows these principles. She's not having like breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, and timing everything. She just eats when she's hungry, and her appetite is actually moderated by her own body, which is the way an animal should work. We don't like lions are not sitting watching the clock deciding when to eat, when next to eat. They eat when they're hungry and they stay muscular and lean. I am no longer food obsessed. And I now enjoy socializing, focusing on the experience rather than the food table. Okay, so that's Margie's experience. Now, finally, the next steps. So you may very well feel like this. 
what is Jono saying? He's just blowing my mind. And some of you might be like, yeah, damn straight. I knew all this stuff and Jono is right. Some people might think Jono is an absolute nutter and I don't know how anyone gave him a microphone and that's cool too. So if you like what I had to say, I'd love you to give me a like. I appreciate that, like the post because then Facebook thinks it's useful. And then um, I'm going to actually tell you something now. So if you are keen to find out more and take your journey to the next level, it is a good time to pay attention. And I would like you to, to let me sell you something. So I want you all, at least one person to say, yes, Jono, I'm ready. I'm ready for you to sell me. I want to know what you've got. I want to know how I can take this journey to the next level. Just a yes. One comment that says, okay, Jono, let's hear the pitch. Go for it. And I'll just, I'll just be waiting over here. It's a bit awkward because I know there's a time lag. Yay! Yes. Okay. I've got some people here. They're saying, yes, sell me, sell me. I'm ready. Okay. 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 I'm ready. Thanks, Calvin. You rock. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Facebook user one and two. Helen, Carol, you rock. Okay. So here we are. First, one last little photograph of my wife. God, I love her. She's so great. She's down 24. And uh, she says, I want this for myself. So it is something I do. This is just an illustration of the mindset that it takes to have lasting results. So it's not like, oh, I've been strong. I'm holding, biting my nails, whatever. She says, I want this for myself. So it's something I do to treat myself or be kind to myself, not something I feel I have to do to punish myself or correct some kind of wrong. Now, she did decide to keep her, and uh, that's fine. But uh, I promise that's legit my wife. Okay, so join the 2% who lose weight and keep it off. So I've got this like cluster of products, and I'll tell you what the special deal is at the end. But the first thing is the RMR web app. Now, the RMR web app stores all of my recipes, all of our meal plans. It's got tracking tools, shopping lists. You can track your weight. You can track your um, blood pressure if your blood is super cool. There's a dashboard, and we call this the tool you would use to monitor or at least manage your journey. And it's 200 Rand a month. So for three months, it's 600 Rand. And it's a super awesome tool. Then for years, we have been selling the RMR flagship 12-week online course. Now, what we did was we took all the people who we follow, uh, all the experts, the best talks from the internet, and we put them into an online course. And then we put a meal plan in each week. And then we took... The best people on transformation, so Mel Robbins, Tony Robbins, who are totally unrelated. Um, we took, uh, what's his name, Matthew Walker, the sleep expert, Johan Hari, the addiction expert. Um, in fact, he's also an expert on depression. We took all these, we took their best talks, and we put them into the same course. And so what you have is a weekly lesson or a weekly module that has a meal plan, a lesson on keto science, and a lesson on transformation from world experts. And then obviously I would say that the, the, the meal plan is raised from like kind of me, sort of like good cook guy. And so that is the online course. That's a week online course designed for you to transform your life or at least be equipped to completely transform your life with keto transformation stuff and a meal plan. And that's a 1500 Rand three month course. And then we developed the habit building program. Um, which speaks to that one slide I showed you from James Clear about like building the habits where there's the value of disappointment or latent potential and then what we think it's going to look like and what it actually looks like. Now, this program is designed for that, but it's actually so much more than that. So there are actually four programs in this one program and it's 1500 Rand, which the price is definitely going to change on this thing, very breaking it into about three different products. And so there's a series of lectures from Bridget. And she does 12 live workshops in Zoom. And she talks about um, keto nutrition. So she's my co-author on the blue book behind me, The Raising Superheroes. And, um, and that's super cool. Then I run a, a series of workshops on transformation. So how I transform my life. I call it high performance mindset. And then Victoria is a psychologist. And she runs a series of eating psychology lectures. And so they're weekly and they're during the day, but we record them and we email them out to everyone every Friday. And that runs on a week cycle. And that's part of the habit building program too. So that is one, two of online courses plus the habit building theory. So that's like a four in one thing. And this is, and now I'm going to tell you what the four in one bundle is. So the four in one bundle, which I'm actually, this is what I'm selling you now. So if you weren't sure what I was, I'm selling this. Okay. Is it's a combination of the 12 week online banting course 
all the workshops from the habit building program. So those four programs into one program, then the, and the web app. And then if you buy this whole bundle, we will give you a, a 2000 Rand discount for the ITSAC program, which is a 12,000 Rand program. It's like the next level of program. It's like crazy good. Now that is a total of 5,600 Rands with the value. In fact, I would say that it's actually a lot more than that if you break up the habit building program into the full programs. And that is insane. That is like insane value. And, and so the impact of the programs I've done with RMR has allowed me to develop my self-confidence in a way that will serve me for the rest of my life. So this is Tessa. Tessa did the online course. Then she upgraded to coaching. Then she worked with me one-on-one -on -one for a while. And then she did the eating psychology program. While she was doing that, she was training to become a coach. And she's now a coach at Real Meal Revolution. And oh, she's a part of the furniture now. But she's completely transformed her life. And so all of that, that 5,600 rands worth of value, which is already undervalued, we're selling in the four-in-one bundle for 1,500 rand. Can you believe that? I can't believe that. I can't believe it so much that this is like the last time I'm selling this thing. Okay, 1,500 rand today. And if Wendy, if you are watching this, please drop the link in the thing um, because the four-in-one bundle is, is expires at the end of this week on Thursday. And we'd like to have as many of you as possible in the workshop. So now is a great time for you to ask some questions. Okay. If you have any questions, come on live. Otherwise, please follow the link. If anyone has the link, if you don't have the link, I will get you the link quickly while you think of a question. Hit me with anything you've got. Link is coming in hot. There we go. Oh. Roasted cashews and almonds, good on banting. Okay. So, okay, now we're into like general banting Q&A. That's cool. So I'm just going to park this uh, here and I'll just keep talking, but I want everyone to see the deal while I chat. So nuts. Okay. So in general, nuts are fine. Peanuts are technically a legume and they are like... They're, they're, the jury is out about them. Some of us think they're cool. Some of us think they're not. I'm like less religious about nuts. When do make a difference is when they are, depending on how they are roasted. It depends on how they're roasted. So most roasted nuts are actually oil roasted. And so it's not like a vegetable where you toss it in a boil and you, and you put it in the oven. How they roast nuts is actually by deep frying them. So if you get a nut roasting machine, you will see that it, the nuts go in the one side and they go on this conveyor belt and then they get dropped in deep fryer oil and they are deep fried until they're like golden brown and they go into a drying rack and they get salted. So any roasted nuts, you'll see like the salt actually sticks to them a little bit. And the reason for that is because the salt sticking to the oil. So those are like the bad nuts, poo poo nuts, do not do those nuts. Um, the good nuts are nuts that are dry roasted. So you will get dry roasted nuts from a brand called Roastwell if you're in South Africa. I, I think they're all over the country. I know that you get them in the Western Cape. Roastwell. Um, and then when it comes to different types of nuts, you know, the, the different nut types have different carb counts. In general, nuts have more carb than we would like to admit. So we eat a lot of nuts, but, but they're not like super low carb. Um, my favorite nut is a macadamia nut and are good. So most nut oils are high in mono unsaturated fat. So, and that is like the good, the good fat. So do, do nut oils if you can, they are expensive. And the problem with nut oils is that often have the flavor of the nut. So they're like, you can have certain nut oils for certain recipes. Alrighty. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, if you just keep dropping questions into this, comment stream we monitor the these streams quite well so we'll be able to anyway but our drivers also good on banting kelvin these are fantastic questions okay so drivers is again it's it depends good good drivers doesn't have filler in it and um and so the filler is usually going to be like um grain and the grain would be like either oats or just wheat and so if it has like oats and wheat in it, then no, you don't want to eat it. But if it's made by like 
proper farmer or in like a, what I like to call a work butchery where the people care about no grain and whatever, then it's probably good. So, so you'll see like the cheap stuff that you see at the, at the, at like a Seven Eleven. I wouldn't touch that, but I know that J and M and chops and a few other brands in the Western Cape, they, they do grain built on. Um, and yeah, and if it's come in a packet, you just look on the back to see if it's got filler in the label. So if it's got like oats, or if it says allergens, gluten, then you know it's got grain in it and you shouldn't eat it. But in general, drill is, is cool. Okay, rock and roll, peeps. I'm going to close off uh, the broadcast. Thank you. I know it's Monday and some of you have been like not working for the last hour of work. Luckily, this is work for me, even though it was lots of fun chatting to you on the other side. And uh, if you have any comments, if you enjoyed that, like the post, leave a comment, say, yes, Jono, you rock. We love that. Or leave a question so that I can update this deck for next time and, and answer it in the deck. Otherwise, have a fantastic time. This welcome session is on Friday, and I hope that you sign up now immediately so you can start going through the material and come to the welcome se uh, session with questions. I will see you on the other side. Keep it real, everybody. Take care of yourselves.